The Cordyceps infection in The Last of Us is based upon a certain type of fungus invading your brain and holding you hostage for a short period of time. Eventually though, the you ceases to be and there is nothing left but an animal operating under the influences of an altered mind. This fungus can enter the body in a multitude of ways and when it does, the outcome is almost 100% absolute. I say almost as there appears to be one person we know of that is immune to the infection and based on human genetics, where there is one, there is more than likely more. But that is a video for another day. Today, however, we will be discussing the first stages of infection and learn what it does to a person and, due to this horrendous infection, learn about how the person behaves and why. Y'all ready? Alright, so without further introduction, let's cover the lore and internal anatomy of the runner from The Last of Us. For those not familiar with The Last of Us, I have made a video discussing the outbreak and the disease in greater detail if you would like to see that. I'll put a card up on screen, but for those who want to just stick around and hear the spark notes, basically an outbreak of a real-world fungus known as Ophio cordyceps unilateralis made the leap from insects to humans more than likely using monkeys as a carrier before crossing over into the human infection form. The crops brought up from South America contained this fungus and upon being eaten changed the host into a bloodthirsty nightmare. The infection was absolute in the early stages, annihilating cities before spreading into more rural areas. The governments of the world fell quite quickly as they were not able to manage this type of infection and no natural or synthetic immunities were found. This led to the collapse of society and an authoritarian government in the United States, as millions of infected were walking the street. 60% of the human population was infected and then began to either infect or eat other people. The infection takes over the host by infecting their brains. Upon entering the body, it will travel to the cerebrospinal fluid, where it will begin a very minor incubation period before the effects on the individual can be seen. As time passes, the infection becomes worse, yielding something likened to an animal more than a human. Alright, so basically you are all caught up now. So let's continue with the first episode discussing the runner. The plight of the runner is honestly quite tragic. Not only has this person been infected, meaning it's basically a game over scenario for them, but they are still very much alive and functioning throughout the infection's progression until their cerebrum has reached a certain level of damage that the person is no longer thinking. Unfortunately, this could take quite a while, so the person is along for the ride in the meantime. In fact, you can almost liken it to Private Jenkins in Halo almost. Upon his infection from the flood, he didn't fully change into a combat form and his mind mind was still functional. He could feel pretty much everything happening in his body. Bones snapping, muscle and skin ripping, nerves being torn apart. This was a lot like the runner in reality. They are conscious throughout the process of their infection and any attacks they suffer brought on by the cordyceps, say like another human defending themselves, they too will feel this. But how is it possible they do all this but still do not control themselves? Again, the tale is quite tragic. When a person is either bitten or breathes in the spores containing the cordyceps fungus, it will quickly make its way into the bloodstream. Here it easily catches a free ride to the cerebrospinal fluid. The spinal fluid is a type of fluid that surrounds the spine and runs throughout your head. It supports the brain tissue with mechanical pressure but also provides a buffer to prevent damage as well as provide an area for the immune system to operate should there be a brain infection. This is where the cordyceps fungus thrives. In this area it begins its rapid growth. One to two days after being bitten or inhaling the spores, the host will begin to exhibit symptoms of aggression and irritation. But why exactly does this happen? So from here on out, I am going to refer to the cerebrospinal fluid as CSF. So just as a heads up, because saying that is actually somewhat of a tongue twister. Anyhow, the location of the CSF ventricles run right next to an area of the brain that if it was located anywhere else, we probably would not have aggressive infected. This area is called the limbic system. The limbic system is responsible for a multitude of happenings in the body, but one portion in particular particular is of great interest, the amygdala. The amygdala, when stimulated, is responsible for anger, fear, and aggression in humans. However, in more aggressive people, just as like an anecdotal thing, this area will actually light up much brighter in MRI scans when a person is shown aggressive faces than those that do not have as much amygdala stimulation. Anyhow, so stimulation of the amygdala will in turn make the person feel either fear or aggression. So these ventricles almost butt up against this area, making it quite easy for the cordyceps to pierce the this particular portion of the brain. Upon it doing this, it can stimulate the neurons in the area even though there was no outside signal that it should be stimulated. This will cause a person to be sent into an aggressive nature without the brain controlling the feeling. Again, it should be noted that the rest of the brain is stimulated by the cordyceps, but sending a message from the amygdala causes the brain to enter an excited state, leading to this uncontrollable behavior. Humans infected with the cordyceps fungus have a hyperactive amygdala that will respond aggressively in situations, but a 
counterbalance to this is that the Cerebrum still does have some minor control over the body. Should a person keep their distance or not attack, it has been seen that some runners will not pursue a person, instead staying where they are. This could be that there are attempts by them to override the signal to attack, but as the infection continues this ability will be lost. They react strongly to gunfire showing fear as well, but still pressing the attack despite their fear as they are being controlled. Another crucial portion of the brain that is affected is the hypothalamus. For those that watch my feeder necromorph episode, I reference that if this area becomes altered in any way, humans will actually resort to cannibalism if necessary to stay alive. Again, this is what is so horrible about this infection as the host struggles for control. When the cordyceps enters the hypothalamus region of the brain, it too will activate the neurons in this area, and upon their stimulation, extreme hunger will overcome the individual. This is why the infected will seek out anything moving and making noise to eat. An infected brain essentially believes that it is starving to death despite no indication from the body due to the forced stimulation of the hypothalamus. However, the cerebrum is well aware that they are not starving and is also aware of what they are doing. When an infected chases down a person, they immediately begin to basically dig in. Liken it to almost a seizure, the brain is experiencing it, but it cannot be controlled by the individual. They are compelled to eat regardless of what they believe or even want. This is evidenced by a particular portion of the game where a newly infected chases down presumably someone that they know in their group. She can be heard crying and wailing in between the eating, knowing that she is literally eating somebody she knows or potentially cares about, yet can't stop. <laughs> Another portion of the brain heavily altered by the cordyceps is the optic nerve and subsequently the eyes of the person. When the cordyceps enters the optic nerve, this is actually a great disadvantage to the infected as it begins to affect their ability to actually see. The cordyceps presumably would destroy the nervous tissue in the area via pressure, which in turn would cause blind spots and tunnel vision for the infected. As this infection progresses, they will lose their sight entirely. For the time being though, the fungus begins to collect in the eyes themselves. This causes the bioluminescence to glow orange. They're still able to see for the most part, but it should be noted that there are more than likely some effects happening to the occipital lobe. Due to the close location with the cerebral spinal fluid, cordyceps more than likely has entered this area early on as well. Any information taken in by the remaining optic nerve transmitted to the occipital lobe would essentially stimulate the area and thus the cordyceps, which would then activate other portions of the brain even more. Not to mention the still naturally functioning areas of this brain would still be working as well. All essentially informing your location to the brain and thus the fungus. Another majorly interesting area of the brain that is arguably the last bit of resistance we see out of this person is the cerebellum. The cerebellum is responsible for the motor control and movement of a human. Think of it as almost a mini brain at the base of your normal brain. It is tasked with keeping us up and moving. It is surrounded by cerebral spinal fluid as well and I know I said I was going to say CSF but uh, it's just interchangeable. I know man old habits die hard. Anyhow just like with the occipital lobe this area has become pierced early on. However, due to its size, there are areas that may even be cordyceps free. Due to this being the case, runner's movement is sluggish and stunted. Stumbling around and twitching, this is a clear sign of neuron activation sending signals to the muscle. And considering as stated above that some choose not to pursue humans, this is a clear indication that they are resisting movement to a certain degree. Even when the cordyceps compels them to move, they are resisting every step. But for the most part, it is a futile effort. As the cordyceps continues deeper into the cerebellum, it is clear that this ability is lost, leading to the infection forms later who continue to move unhindered. But the power of the cerebrum is still operating and sending signals to the cerebellum in an effort to override these commands, perhaps giving the survivors a better shot, at least early on. The cerebral spinal fluid is a major medium for the brain and shows concerning instincts. Literally surrounded by fluid exists the medulla, pons, and midbrain. Again, for those that don't know, this is the lizard brain, which is basically the most instinctual part of humanity and where a lot of our basic urges come from, no matter what they are. Cordyceps easily corrupts this area and as such corrupts our instincts. This leads to an animal incapable of thought or feelings as the cerebrum is negated. Liken it to you riding, being the passenger in a car while a drunken tree drives. 
That's basically the cordyceps infection. The last leaves you trapped inside your own head for a time. Unable to move at will, act, speak. You are literally in a body with your eyesight as it goes dark and you eat others around you. Eventually, however, the cordyceps will destroy the cerebrum as seen in later infection forms, but for the time, the runner is simply a person stuck in a 30-70 split for control with this fungus. You may be asking, but Roanoke, considering the immune system has a large presence in the cerebral spinal fluid, wouldn't the body fight? Well, it appears that the in-game lore matches the real-life lore. They essentially state that the immune system is not activated, which disturbingly holds up in real life as well. Cordyceps is a known immune system suppressant in humans and is used for medical purposes right now. So it's helpful in our universe, but in the Last of Us universe, it appears as though the immunosuppressant properties stop the body from fighting back entirely. And this is based upon a log, so spoiler alert, I really suppose, but this game's been out for a while, concerning Ellie's immunity which I'm going to be covering in much greater detail in a later episode, she has antibodies that actually attack and destroy the fungus effectively. There is speculation as to why this is the case, but just know that your immune system appears to never become activated at the presence of the fungus, and kind of ironically, the fungus is what gives your immune system the all clear, everything's okay. There may be some ways around this by stimulating the immune system to attack a similar disease by using HLA markers. That would require us though to find something close enough to the cordyceps. Talking about that Last of Us Part 2 playa? The morphology of a runner is very simplistic, as it's basically just you and I, with a few minor exceptions, such as skin rashes and eyes that glow and look off in different directions. There really is nothing too noteworthy about the changes, as they all seem to be internal in this runner. So there you have it, the internal anatomy changes as well as lore on the runner. Pretty terrifying, right? Well, perhaps it's a scientist in me, but if I could really, like, negate the loss of life, this would be quite an interesting infection to study. But but I'm gonna go ahead and pull for this to never happen as it seems like a kind of nail in the coffin for our species. Pretty terrible. Anyhow, if you enjoyed the video, leaving a like helps get this thing into the algorithm and out there, you know, so other people can see it. If you are new and enjoyed it, then subbing is a great way to keep up with the channel. I will drop my Discord, Twitter, and Patreon links in the description. And of course, speaking of patrons, I would like to thank mine. At the scientist tier, we have Arulam Lupe, and then we got your boy Artyom Chiornich. Next up, it's not a spoon. Our residents are A. Laurentis, Greater Genes 83 and Oz Hickman. Next up with our PhD in genetics, we have Allison Casparo, Andrew Lawson, Divine Whisper, and Laffy No Skill. Holding it down with their masters in biology, we have Adam Hartswick, Brandon Brotherton, Cameron Smith, Edgy McGee, John Russo, Scott Grant, The Rena Lies, The Otter Man, and Zervelian. And last but not least, with their bachelors in morphological sciences, we have add to the list Ahiao Comics, Anthony Wolf, Captain Gas Mask, Dustin Ellis, Jims, Professor Binnips, Riot, and Russell McBride. Thank you guys for your continued support. So, let me ask you this question for everybody still around. Uh, straight up, do demons actually have a really high internal body temperature? I can't find any information on it. I believe they might, but I'm doing a collaboration and it's all predicated on these body temperatures. So if you know anything about any of this, like say it down in the comments because I'm going to read them. So thank you guys for watching and I will see y'all in the next one.